Okay, next on the agenda is House File 2656 from Representative Walgamon. I will move that House File 2656 be referred to the General Register. We also have an author's amendment. Representative Walgamon, Walgamon why don't you explain your bill and then I, then I will move the amendment. Representative Walgamon, to your bill. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, members. When the COVID-19 pandemic first broke out in Minnesota, we as a legislature came together in a united and bipartisan fashion to pass a law creating a workers' compensation presumption for frontline workers who contract COVID-19. The workers under this presumption include police and peace officers, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, nurses, healthcare workers, corrections officers, home care and long-term care workers, and child care providers. How this works, Mr. Chair and members, is pretty simple. If any of these workers test positive for COVID-19, it is presumed that they got it on the job and they're eligible to receive workers' compensation benefits. It was a great moment of bipartisan and unity to this pandemic. And I wanna thank each of the members on this committee who came together to pass this law and have the backs of our frontline workers. Since we passed that law, Mr. Chair and members, I'm proud to say that it has worked exactly as intended. Approximately 22,573 workers have received compensation under the presumption. Uh, we'll see more as the claims continue to get processed. And the cost has been right around $20 million which may seem small compared to the initial projected cost of anywhere up to $500 million. But these claims are making a big difference for the workers and their families. The average indemnity payment to a worker is $1,000. And if there's medical involved, the average payment is about $9,600. So again, small in the grand scheme of the workers' compensation funding system, but a huge difference for the budgets of the families of these frontline workers. Unfortunately, Mr. Chair and members, this law sunset on December 31st of 2021. So for the past month, we have been asking over 183,000 of our public safety, healthcare, and childcare workers to serve our communities on the front lines of this pandemic without any guarantee that they will receive compensation if they can track COVID-19. Mr. Chair, I, I find this unacceptable. We need to have the backs of these workers. So that's why I'm coming forward with uh, House File 2656. It uh, modifies the enactment date to cover those who have contracted this virus um, to, to January 1st to cover since the previous sunset date. And it extends the sunset date of this law to May 31st of 2023. This date will ensure that the next legislature will have the entirety of session to extend the sunset date if there remains a need and that no frontline workers are again left uncovered. And then as I mentioned, this bill also retroactively modifies the date of enactment to January 1st, 2022, so that we can have the backs of the estimated 2,000 frontline workers who have contracted COVID-19 in the past month. But as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, I do have an author's amendment, uh, which is essentially a, a severability clause that simply states that if any part of this bill is ruled unconstitutional, that the rest of the bill is in effect as of the date of its enactment. I'm bringing this forward, Mr. Chair, because there have been some concerns brought forward that it would be unconstitutional to cover these workers retroactively. Uh, I've spoken with, with several legal experts who don't think that would be the case, but uh, I wanna assure that, uh, that this ruling does not throw out the retroactive baby with the entire presumptive bathwater. So I'm bringing forward this amendment just to be safe. I want to acknowledge, Mr. Chair, uh, the involvement of the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. I uh, really respect the statute issued process that they have in approving workers' compensation policy. That's why I brought this bill uh, to them in the past, and so we'll continue to work with them going forward. Uh, but unfortunately, Mr. Chair, the WCAC has not moved fast enough to cover these workers. WCAC has known about this sunset for the past 10 months. And in fact, it was a, a WCAC compromise that got us into this mess in the first place with the December 31st, uh, 2021 sunset date. You know, here we are, it's January 31st, 2022. And unfortunately, the WCAC has no plan. They have no agreement. Uh, when I met with them in uh, last Wednesday, 
They still hadn't reached an agreement and they were going to not meet again until February 9th of 2022. Now, luckily during that time, um, they've decided to uh, have a meeting tomorrow. I'm, I'm really hopeful that you know, I can work with them, that the members uh, from this body who are on that council can work with them to reach an agreement. Um, I'd be, you know, if they reach an agreement, I'll be happy to support it. I'm even open to using this bill as a vehicle so that we can fast track that agreement and get this, these workers covered. But Mr. Chair and members, I, I'm not gonna let our, this committee, I'm not gonna let this legislature sit around and, and twiddle our thumbs while our public safety, healthcare and childcare workers are exposing themselves physically and financially with no guarantee of, of getting compensation. That's why I'm bringing this bill forward despite a lack of a WCAC agreement. In closing, Mr. Chair and members, I just want to remind you that every day that goes by, we are seeing a projected 65 on average, 65 of our frontline workers are contracting COVID-19, again, leaving them and their families on the hook anywhere from $1,000 to $9,600. Members, let's come together. Let's have, like we have in the past, let's have the backs of these heroic men and women who are keeping us safe, taking care of us when we're sick, and caring for our children on the front lines of the pandemic. I ask for your support to move this bill through this committee. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have a few testifiers to share their remarks. I'd like to turn it over to my first testifier, Mr. Brian Peters, who is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Peace and Police Officers Association. Rep Representative Wolgamont, everything runs through the chair. I will call the uh, test fires. We still need to move the amendment that you talked about. Uh, thank you, Representative Wolgamont, for your testimony. I will move the author's amendment A22. And Representative Wolgamont has already explained that. So members, any questions about the amendment? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so seeing no questions, all those in favor of adopting the 2822 amendment, please unmute and say aye. 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 Mr. Chair, you muted yourself. There you go, playing around with the, with the mouse again. Opposed, say nay. <laughs> Motion or the amendment is adopted. Now we will get to test fires, Representative Wolgamont. First up on the test fire list is Brian Peters, Executive Director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. Mr. Peters, oh, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Petrie, there have been a couple of members that missed the roll call. I want you to make note of the ones that are here now, but we did have a quorum to start with. Uh, Mr. Peters, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Eklund, members of the committee. My name is Brian Peters. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. We represent over 10,000 public safety officials across the state. I'm here to testify in support of House File 2656 in its entirety. Representative Wogamont did a, a very good job explaining um, the need. You know, almost two years ago, we sat on the Capitol uh, stairs to uh, push this bill through. Nobody um, could predict that Two years later, we would be sitting here still debating this issue. Nurses, firefighters, EMTs, police officers, they don't have the choice of working from home. They don't have the choice to get on meetings like this over Zoom. They have to go out and do their jobs. They can't turn away patients. Police officers can't refuse to, to give CPR uh, to someone in need. They have to do their job. And uh, it's very important that we continue to support. And I understand the complexities of the work comp issue, the presumption, uh, the money associated with it, but we're still here almost two years later with no end in sight. And we need to support our frontline workers and continue to give them the protection that they need. It needs to be retroactive. And I agree with Representative Wogelmont. So we're not running to the same issue next uh, January that we go into the next session with an expiration date. Hopefully next year um, this will pass, but nobody can predict that. And again, I, I urge members, Chair, to support Representative Wogelmont's bill. This is important. Uh, we are not um, out of the woods on this at all, and our workers need that protection. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Members, we'll, uh, we'll hold questions till the end uh, of the test fires. We've got half a dozen here. Uh, next up is Commissioner Rosalind Robertson from the Department of Labor and Industry. Commissioner, welcome back to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, <clears throat> my name is Rosalind Robertson. I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. I'm here today to remind the group, uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of House File 2656. But I'm also here today to remind the committee that the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council is charged with making recommendations to Minnesota Chapter 176 the chapter that guides the administration of the workers' compensation system. That the language of the statute charges the Work Comp Advisory Council to make its recommendations to the legislature by February 1st. Ironically, we are scheduled to meet tomorrow to complete our discussions on recommendations that will be forwarded to the legislature in this year's workers' compensation packet. For the record, the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council has been meeting since last August, um, discussing presumption um, and COVID, um, the COVID experience all the way around including the presumption. At this time, I am confident that the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council will reach agreement. I have maintained contact with the, um, with the leaders of the council, those representing business, those representing labor. And I am confident that we have, um, we have discussed the concerns around the reinstatement of the presumption provision, and I'm confident that an agreement will be reached. Part of the agreement requires that the majority of both business and labor representatives um, agree to any recommendations. Um, and therefore, uh, having consensus of the council is critically important as we advance any recommendations. Our agenda is quite short for tomorrow. The primary feature on the agenda is the presumption. I have had communications, ongoing communications with the business rep and the labor rep, and I'm confident that an agreement will be reached and we will be on time in making our recommendations to the legislature. I would ask that this committee respect the integrity of the council and allow the council to complete its business before advancing any other bill to the contrary. I thank Representative Wogamont for his commitment to work in people. We share that commitment, but I'm hopeful that we can uh, conclude the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council um, business and, and, forward, sorry, and forward the recommendations to the legislature as soon as the vote is taken tomorrow. Thank you. That concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to stick around for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. We have uh, five more test fires. We'll take questions after the testimony is done, unless uh, there's some kind of burning thing. Representative McDonald, I do have you down on the list. Um, um, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. Yeah, I think I'll uh, wait to hear the, let the other testifiers finish up first. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Next up is Mary Turner, ICU nurse and president of the Minnesota Nurses Association. Ms. Turner, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. 
My name is Mary Turner, and I'm a night shift ICU, COVID ICU nurse at Northmore Medical Center in Robinson, Minnesota. Just got off the night shift this morning at 7.30. I'm also the elected president of the Minnesota Nurses Association in Minnesota, where we are 80% of the bedside hospital nurses in the state. And I'm here on, the, on behalf of 22,000 nurses across the state to implore you to pass House File 2656 as amended. As we approach the third year of this pandemic, nurses have done what we've always done, step up to care for people regardless of the situation. One number, one concern is our patients. As a COVID ICU nurse who's been on the front line since the very beginning, I know this pandemic isn't through with us. I see it every day in the hospital as our COVID beds are still full. However, as we see more and more of the public and state returning to normal, please remember that nurses will be forever changed by this pandemic. I hear from nurses across the state daily, regardless of the hospital they work at or the unit they work in. They share similar experiences of what it's like on the front lines of this pandemic. For more than two years, we nurses have worked longer shifts and more shifts. We risk our health and the health of our families to care for Minnesotans. We have gone to every length to contain the spread of the virus at home and in our communities. Many of us have isolated ourselves from our spouses and our children living in garages and trailers to protect our family from the virus. We've been the lone connective thread between patients and their families, the ones holding the iPad for the loved ones so they can visit them virtually. And we've been the ones holding the hands of COVID patients to bring some semblance of comfort as they pass away alone. Through all of this, we've had to fight for the smallest things. We've had to fight for adequate testing. We've had to fight for enough N95s and the ability to use them correctly and safely. We fought for isolation counts. We fought for the ability to shower before leaving the hospital. We had to fight for our pay too. Every time we had symptom or any risk of exposure, we quarantined and waited for a test result. It often meant using our hard earned benefits to cover the missed shift or go without pay entirely. Now we beg of you, please don't make us fight for this too. The rampant spread of this omnic variant increases the likelihoods of nurses getting COVID through their day-to-day -day work. Just a week ago, we had six experienced COVID ICU nurses out on my floor. With continuing staffing issues, nurses are taking on more shifts and with it, more risks. I gave report this morning to a nurse who was gonna have three ICU patients when she should have one to two. Rather than fight for workers' comp, let's focus on the grueling work of caring for the patients who are sicker than any I've seen in my career as a nurse. I've heard from nurses nearly every day this month, worried and concerned about the lack of COVID presumptive eligibility. They're worried they'll get sick and their claim will get denied. Then they'll be forced to use their own time off or go without pay. This is the most stressful time to be a nurse that I can ever remember. Our nurses should not be worried or stressed out about their finances if they get sick or if they need to stay home to keep their patients safe. I beg of you, please lessen the stress and the burden on the frontline workers who care for Minnesotans during this pandemic. Please vote yes on House File 2656 as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Next up is Aaron Cocking, President and CEO of Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Mr. Cocking, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your te testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the record, Aaron Cocking, Insurance Federation of Minnesota, thank you for the opportunity to testify on House File 2656 this afternoon. This is the third year that I have have testified on the COVID-19 presumption issue. And during those three years, one thing has become crystal clear. People have been led to believe that absent this presumption, frontline workers would not be covered for illnesses arising out of their jobs. This is absolutely false. Workers are covered. 
Let me be clear on this. If this bill doesn't pass, these workers still have workers' compensation coverage for contracting COVID-19 in the course and scope of their job. Full stop. This is the most critical takeaway for my testimony today for the committee to hear. When the pandemic first started, nobody knew what COVID-19 was or what it would become. We didn't fully understand how it was transmitted and what steps could be taken to avoid transmission. In the earliest days, the presumption the legislature passed made sense because of all those unknowns. What we are seeing now is a virus that is largely being transmitted through community spread. COVID has become an ordinary disease of life, like the flu or the cold. That's not to say that COVID is ordinary, but that it has become so common that everybody is at risk of getting it. With that being said, how then do we differentiate between workplace and community acquisition? Workers' compensation is not and should not and was never intended to replace health insurance. And that is important to keeping the proper balance in our work comp system. One of the biggest problems with this bill specifically, as been alluded to prior, is the retroactive provision. As the Department of Labor and Industry attorney mentioned during last week's Work Comp Advisory Council meeting, when discussing this bill, that provision will cause significant legal issues because it is unconstitutional. And speaking of the Work Comp Advisory Council, Commissioner Robertson did a great job of summing it up. This bill does not have the agreement of that group. I understand their meeting tomorrow to finish that work. For those of you that have been around for any length of time, you know that the legislature doesn't pass uh, legislation related to Chapter 176 if the bill hasn't been agreed to by the WCAC. That's true regardless of which party is in control. That process has worked, and the integrity of that process needs to remain. Much like presumptions, each additional erosion of the process or framework sets up for weakening the balance of a system that in Minnesota has been working relatively well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share our concerns uh, with this committee. Thank you, Mr. Cocking. <clears throat> Next up, we have Brian Rice. Mr. Rice, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee. My name is Brian Rice. I'm an attorney in Minneapolis. I'm here today representing the Minnesota Professional Firefighters, although I'll limit my remarks on that. Also testifying for AFSCME Council 5, which represents correction officers in our state and county facilities, as well as healthcare workers. And I also, Jay Wood uh, was going to testify. He's the head of the Fire Service Foundation. He had to attend a funeral today um, and so asked me to relate some comments. Let me just say something to Mr. Hack or Mr. Cocking. COVID-19 is not ordinary. By any definition of what happens, it's not an ordinary flu or virus. That's just a talking point for business. It's not true. If it was true and this was an ordinary thing, we would not be here today. The, the second thing I'd like to point out is everything that research that I've done, a year ago, we were in front of your committee in March and we thought this would be over. We agreed to an end date of December 31st. The vaccine was out. We thought we'd be great. I didn't expect to be here, like Mr. Peters said. This is the worst surge right now, uh, uh, Omicron. It's, it, uh, uh, Representative Ogemon is right in December, November and December, it was about 2,000 presumption cases. That's before this virus really hit. I think he's being conservative to say there'll be 2,000 infections in January. I, I bet it's gonna be closer to four. And as far as ordinary, Mr. Cocking, uh, four volunteer firefighters have died of COVID in the last two months from uh, Tinta Township, St. Joseph Township, Upsala Township, and just today, South Haven in Wright County, the funeral happened for a volunteer firefighter who died of COVID. We haven't had four volunteer firefighters die in a two-month period in forever, and they're all COVID. Mr. Chair and members of the committee. We also had a uh, EMT, a minister in uh, Swanville who died, a county deputy in Itasca County who died from this COVID. And this is before the big onset of what uh, Omicron is going to mean. And for the last month, we, we allowed the workers' comp committee to come up with a compromise. They decreed that COVID would end on uh, December 31st of 2021. And guess what? It hasn't ended. And this gap that's been created and the constitutional question, that isn't our doing. 
The bill that Representative Wogamont had last year would have extended this into this session, so you could have evaluated. We were hopeful it would end. The business community offered September uh, 1st at their meeting last week as the time to cut this off. I, can the legislature decree an end to this uh, pandemic by that day? I wish you could. I mean, we'd be all for it. But that it, it's it's just not right. If they can reach an agreement tomorrow, that's fine. I would, uh, I, I'm not like the hugest fan of Ronald Reagan. I never voted for him. But he said, uh, trust but verify. We need to verify this because there are 183,000 workers who had this presumption a month ago who don't have it today in every uh, field that you see. And the business community's idea on this, choke us off on September 1st and maybe we'll go away. Well, I hope it's gone, but uh, history hasn't uh, proved that uh, that, that was the uh, case. And this, I, I'll tell you, this, this disease, uh, th this virus has gone up. It's, it's, it's particularly in greater Minnesota, Mr. Chair. Uh, we haven't had any of our 2,000 full-time uh, firefighters die of this yet but it's particularly virulent in Western Minnesota, all those townships I've said, it's, it's, it's there, it's real. And to say it's an ordinary uh, effect, uh, I just have to respectfully disagree with uh, uh, Mr. Cocking. This is a matter of urgent uh, legislative concern and we urge you to pass this bill today and get it passed by the end of the week in some form. And as far as buying another end year, we shouldn't repeat this. Um, uh, uh, Representative Wogamont's got the right idea. This should run well into next year because, like I said, everything I've read, uh, pandemics of this magnitude, and we haven't seen anything this serious since uh, 1918 when my grandmother survived it by living in her uh, grandparents' attic for six months in 100 years. And it's usually two to four years, and we may only be at halftime in this football game. Thank you for uh, indulging me, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rice, for your testimony. Next up, we have Scott Badness, President, Minnesota Professional Firefighters. <clears throat> Mr. Badness, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Scott Badness. I'm professor, uh, President of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters. I'm also a Lieutenant with the Edina Fire Department. Um, we ask you to you uh, pass this Bill 2656 as amended. Uh, my members uh, have a vast history of standing up and protecting the citizens uh, of Minnesota. And when they do that, um, they do it knowing that there's risk there. And what we're asking the state to do is stand behind them and show them that they have their back. I understand that Mr. Cocking said that everybody's still covered by workers' comp. The difference is, is now that they have to fight in order to get their time back. They're taking the time and they're going to have to go back and retroactively prove that they didn't get it from somebody else. Just last week, we had uh, one shift that uh, at the Dyna Fire Department that was basically off for five days, uh, their normal time off. And the day that they were supposed to come back, they were all, uh, or I shouldn't say they all, uh, five of them called in with either confirmed COVID or symptoms of COVID. And they weren't around each other for five days. So they didn't get it from their family. They got it at work. Uh, they were out, you know, they did a call and somebody brought it into the station, even though we're doing everything we can to protect our members. It is important to us that, again, the state stand behind us. We didn't ask, or we didn't, we've asked to try to work from home, but guess what? We can't do that. We need to be there, just like the nurses have to be there, and just like the police officers have to be there. We didn't have the option to call it in and do a Zoom meeting to, to complete our job. So uh, we humbly ask you to pass this bill as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vadness. One more, Representative McDonald, and then, I'll, then uh, Sundin's up before you, and then I'll call you. Uh, right, next on you, Mr. Chair. Next on the agenda, on the uh, test fire list is Ed Reynoso, Teamsters Local 320. Mr. Reynoso, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Edward Reynoso, and I'm the, the Director of Legislative Affairs for Teamsters Local 320. I'm participating in this hearing today in solid support of House File 2656, a bill that will extend the COVID-19 presumption of an on-the-job injury for our frontline first responders and many other workers that we've come to rely heavily on, especially during this pandemic. 
As a Workers' Compensation Advisory Council member, we were recently provided with a slide which showed that the healthcare industry alone, within the healthcare industry alone, there have been 13,188 workers that have been infected with this virus, not by choice, but because of their dedication they put forward in serving our communities. On top of that, 1,328 corrections officers, 1,065 law enforcement officers have also contracted this virus. I come to, to you today also knowing that we have a hearing tomorrow in the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council on this issue. In the event we are not able to, to come up with a, an agreement, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but in the event that we cannot come to an agreement in the Workers' Comp Compensation Advisory Council, I think it's critically important that we are providing an insurance for these workers that are showing up to work every single day, dedicated to our communities, and that we should have their back in return. And I know Mr. Cocking had, had mentioned that these workers already have coverage. So do the meat packing workers, where uh, over a thousand of those meat packers contracted COVID, very likely on the job, and of the thousand that were that had contracted COVID, ten were provided workers' comp benefits. That's not; those aren't good numbers that we could that these workers can rely on to go to work every single day, knowing that in the event that they get COVID, then we're not going to have their back. I urge you, I implore you, move this piece of legislation, if we are able to come to an agreement at the Workers' Comp Compensation Advisory Council tomorrow, by all means, uh, our recommendation could go forward. But if it, it, it isn't what these workers need, I implore you to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynoso. Uh, we have three, uh, three members on the list. And uh, first up is Representative Sundin, then it'll be Representative McDonald, and then Representative Bliss. Representative Sundin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few comments. Uh, probably a question for the author and uh, maybe for the commissioner as well. We'll see where it goes. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll state first that uh, I share the author's passion for labor. That's been my life's work for over 40 years uh, for uh, uh, to represent and uh, uh, make certain that uh, workers are made whole wherever they are. But uh, I'm just uh, need to ask the author, how much contact have you had with the WCAC, uh, let's say since last summer? Have you attended their meetings? Have you uh, uh, forwarded this uh, uh, proposal before them? Representative Wolgamon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Sundin. Um, I have been in touch with my uh, fellow Senate author, uh, Senator Jeff Howe, who's been really just a champion for workers, uh, both starting in, in um, when this pandemic broke out and ever since, he's been great to work with. So I uh, reached out to him back in January, and we brought this, um, we brought this proposal uh, before the WCAC because there was no proposal, so we brought this forward, and that agreement still hasn't been reached. Um, I don't serve on the WCAC, so I wasn't on any of their meetings during the summer. But um, again, I, I hope that you know, we're able to reach a deal and, and can potentially use this bill as a, as a vehicle to get that uh, a deal that is struck done by the WCAC as quickly as possible so that we can cover these workers. Representative uh, Sundin. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you mentioned the other legislative body. Uh, where, where is this proposal uh, over there with the Senate companion? Representative Wolgamon. Uh, I have to double check. I know that I sent the jackets over. I believe it was uh, the intention to have it given its first reading today, but I haven't checked the, the first reading of Senate files today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering if we're doing this uh, in vain or just for practice. Uh, I, I really don't know, but it uh, seems like we're moving quite hastily, uh, you know, and that's evident with the last minute amendment uh, coming through here. You know, in the construction field, uh, rather than uh, being uh, delayed with our uh, work or uh, having to extend into overtime situations or whatever, I've always adhered to a, a, 
a motto of start early and never stay late. And I'm just uh, wondering why in the heck uh, this proposal never got before the uh, Workman's Comp uh, Advisory Council, you know, prior to uh, uh, January of uh, this year. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it befuddles me, I guess. You know, when we have a process that does work, maybe not at the speed some uh, legislators and some people uh, think it should, uh, to come in with a, a, a hasty uh, uh, so solution, uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. I'd uh, like to support it. Uh, but uh, I think I'll be supporting a, a workman's comp advisory bill that uh, reflects all these sentiments as well. So, uh, you know, rather than uh, uh, coming in at the last minute, you know, I, I like the deliberative process. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's disrespectful to uh, uh, skirt around the edges and, uh, and slide this one in. It's a good bill. There's a good process that should have been utilized uh, 100%, you know. And I'll just remind uh, the body and anybody else bringing out uh, labor concerns, there's there's a risk for uh, stepping outside the uh, rules here, you know. Uh, if you don't uh, command the uh, majority in one body or uh, or another, uh, this, this could be setting a precedent that uh, would come back to haunt uh, labor in a big way. So that said, uh, we'll see where the vote goes today. Thank you, Representative Sundin. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, we, this legislature had a, uh, has a history of protecting and taking care of our firefighters and our paramedics, our nurses and healthcare workers, our correctional officers, uh, our um, detention and secure treatment facilities, emergency medical technicians, um, big labor, labor industry, we have a long history of taking care of them. And because of the good work of the legislature, they established a great group with the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. And uh, they've been working since August, you heard the commissioner speak. And I think that at this point, because uh, it's just not ready for prime time, the commissioner says uh, we shouldn't do it, we shouldn't pass this bill. It seems to be a futile uh, movement to bring it a day before the, the Advisory Council is gonna give the recommendation. I just don't understand why Representative Wogamot wouldn't have worked with the WCAC in the first place. Sounded like he didn't even communicate that with them. Uh, that's just not the way we conduct business down here at the Capitol and collectively work. This council is gonna, that is uh, put together with uh, many different folks in the private sector, healthcare workers, insurers, members on the uh, Senate and the House, collaboratively working together in a bipartisan way and he brings this bill that certainly, uh, with not even a, a recommendation or a consultation with them, seems suspicious. So since the commissioner says we shouldn't do it, I fall back on her expertise, and I say we, uh, Mr. Chair, table this bill, uh, and uh, it's not ready for prime time. We should bring up and the bill that will be working on with the uh, WCAC. And frankly, Mr. Uh, Chair, I know you're a, a, you know, a fan and proponent of labor, and this organization, I'm surprised you even gave it a hearing. So I think we should, uh, I make a motion that we table the bill. There is a motion to table. I am uh, um, a, a little bit rusty on this. Uh, if uh, Mr. Reese could give me advice on where we need to go with that. Mr. Chair, I believe we can move to a vote. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Reese. So there is a motion to table this bill. Uh, Mr. Petrie, please take the roll. Mr. Chair, it was a vote. It, there was no request for a roll. Oh, no, I'm sorry. All right, with a motion to table, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. 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 Those have it, motion is not carried. Representative McDonald, any further comments? No, I think that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it would be uh, wise of you and Representative Wolgamont to uh, pull the bill, even though it just failed, and uh, listen to the advice and the wisdom of the commissioner. And Thank wait you, for the council. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Uh, Chair Eklund, this is uh, Representative Raleigh. Representative Raleigh, I have you on the list. 
Roger that, um, Chair Eklund. Uh, I'm rusty on this as I'm rusty on this as well. Um, can we call division while we're in committee meeting? We certainly can, Representative Raleigh. I would like to call division, Chair Eklund. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. Division has been called. Uh, Mr. Petrie, please take the roll. Chair, I start, oh, before he starts that, sorry, just, just as a reminder that um, the vision is different than a, ro a roll call. Since we're not in person, we can't do a visual thumbs up, thumbs down. Mr. Peachy will take a roll call just to get the numbers, but the numbers won't be reflected in the minutes like a typical roll call. I just want that said <clears throat> for the record because it is different than a, a roll call a vote. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Mr. Peachy, please take the roll. Chair Eklund. No. Chair Eklund, no. Representative Zhang. No. Representative Zhang, no. Representative Detmer. Yes. Representative Detmer, yes. Representative McDonald. McDonald, yes. McDonald, yes. Representative Berg. No. Representative Berg, no. Representative Bliss. Yes. Representative Bliss, yes. Representative Edelson. No. Representative Edelson, no. Representative Frederick. No. Representative Frederick, no. Representative Greenman. No. Representative Greenman, no. Representative Nelson. Nelson votes no. Representative Nelson, no. Representative Poston. Yes. Representative Poston, yes. Representative Raleigh. Yes. Representative Raleigh, yes. Representative Sundin. No. Representative Sundin, no. Uh, with Mr. Chair, there's five yeses and eight noes. Thank you, Mr. Petrie. So the division was uh, the bill or the amendment is not, or the motion is not adopted. Sorry, folks. Uh, next, I have on my list, and just so you guys know, I have Bliss, Raleigh, and Greenman, Representative Bliss, uh, and McDonald after Greenman. I'm sorry, Representative Thank Bliss. You, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this is more of a point of order, I guess. Maybe I should have called it uh, during the discussion. Um, is it standard practice to allow a uh, testifier to berate another testifier while he's misquoting and mischaracterizing what he said? Um, Mr. Rice clearly misquoted Mr. Cocking and uh, took some political jabs at him. And I find that totally uncalled for. I'm kind of disappointed you didn't call him on it at that time. Uh, is that something that we normally allow in committees? Representative Bliss, I've seen any any in, in my uh, <clears throat> few years here, and I don't want to sound like I've been around a long time, but I've seen many different types of testimony in committees. So uh, I, I don't know that this was out of the ordinary or not. So I'd, I'd have to rely on other members to add to that. Representative Bliss. All right. Well, just uh, make note of it that that, I, in my opinion, was completely uncalled for. And in my opinion, the chair should have called him at, uh, on the carpet at the time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do respect your leadership. Duly noted, Representative Bliss, thank you. Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've got a couple questions. Um, I want to go back to um, the procedure that we just did, um, and, and potentially the chair or the, the author could answer this one. What would have happened if we had tabled this bill until tomorrow? Because the WCAC is going to be voting tomorrow. Would we even have been able to get this bill through the House by uh, the time that we heard the um, the decision from the WCAC? Representative Raleigh, I'm not sure on that. Um, I would say probably not. Uh, Representative Wolgamont, I see he had his finger, finger raised, so maybe he can help with that. Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. So it's my understanding that right now there is not for sure going to be a vote on any proposal. I don't know that the WCAC has reached an agreement. Again, they've They've known about this issue since uh, I think we passed the sunset back in March a year ago. So I'm at a loss for why the WCAC hasn't been able to reach a deal by this point. Again, I'm, I'm not on the WCAC. All I can do as a legislator is introduce a bill on the first day of session, which is what I'm doing. Um, but it's my understanding that there, there is not for sure going to be a vote. However, if there was going to be a vote, and again, I would, I would love for them to, to be able to reach an agreement on this, um, we could, one option, I'm not, I don't know if this, you know, I'm open to this, 
uh, would be to use this bill as a potential vehicle for that WCAC agreement so that we can get enacted into law as soon as possible and get these workers covered. Again, that's just an option that's, I'd be open to that. Um, but uh, that, I guess, is my understanding to the answer to your question as far as this bill, how it relates to a potential agreement by the WCAC tomorrow. Thank, Thank, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that does lead into the next one. Um, I am concerned that we are, pre that we are preemptively um, adding an amendment that is looking at the constitutionality of this. And if we're already worried about the constitutionality, I worry that if with, without the signal from the WCAC, without peace in the Valley, without understanding what their intent is, um, I really, really worry that we are sending a signal that we are legislatively going to go around the good work that they're trying to do. Now, I'm, I'm in agreement with, uh, with Brian Peters. I'm in absolute agreement with uh, um, Commissioner Robertson. The, uh, I'm a former EMT. I'm a, I was an emergency medical technician. I've got two sisters who are emergency room uh, nurses. I get it. I hear these stories. It's not just in the newspapers. These are things that we're talking about, you know, around the table and, a, you know, at family gatherings. And so the, 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 my points to these questions are not about the workers. It's about the legality and the process that we're going through, because everything that we do is a legislate, uh, legislatively sends a signal both to our partners like the WCAC and to organizations like the MPPOA and others to make sure that the legislation that we're putting through is well thought out, well baked, has enough information from the, the, the parties that are concerned that we have thoughtful legislation that goes through. And, and I am, Mr. Chair, I am concerned about the timing of this, knowing that we can't get anything through um, in the next, let's say, 72 hours, and we're less than 24 hours from the WCAC meeting and having a vote on this. And I wanna go back um, to uh, Commissioner Robertson's statement. Um, she implored us to quote, respect the council. And I, I fear that even though I wanna support what's going on, I wanna support the, uh, this preemption, I also wanna make sure that we are working with our partners and our, our compendium agencies in a way that does exactly that word. It respects the good work that they're doing. And I'm, I'm just worried that uh, we are sending a signal that would um, put that relationship at risk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. Representative Walgamont, you had a, a quick response to that, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I, I want to underscore how much I respect the WC. AC and will, you know, if they are able to reach an agreement, um, that's great. But again, every day that goes by there, based on the numbers from December, there are 65 of our frontline workers who are getting this virus. And Mr. Chair and Representative Raleigh, when I uh, initially got to the meeting um, last week, the WCAC was not playing on a meeting again until February 9th. Um, I, I don't want to subscribe any intentions or anything, but I'm glad that since we started pushing this forward, now they've been able to find time to meet on February 1st, which I think is great. And again, I hope to reach a deal, but Mr. Chair and, and Representative Rowell, I just want to share that with you to explain again, kind of you know, why I'm taking this track and why I feel this urgency to, to get this legislation uh, ready to go and be ready to, to get passed so that we don't have to go every 24 hours that we go by, there are more and more workers getting left out in the dust. And this has been thoughtful. That's why we do have the, the severity pause in there. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. Representative Mr. Walton, Chair, 10, Rep 10 seconds. Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative Wolgamont, uh, I thank you very much. That's a really good point. However, according to what you said, according to the testimony that we've got, whether we pass this today or we honor and respect the WCAC and wait until tomorrow, nothing is going to happen other than showing respect for the WCAC. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh. Next on the list is Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Wagaman. I do have a question, but I just I do think it's important uh, to I agree with you, uh, uh, Representative Raleigh. I think what we do here sends a signal, 
And I think what we heard uh, Ms. Turner, uh, Mr. Reynoso, Mr. Rice, and Mr. Peters say is that workers right now, the, our frontline staff, uh, uh, police officers, firefighters, nurses, EMTs need this and have actually been operating without it. And, um, and so I think it absolutely, we should not relinquish our obligation uh, to the folks in our district and to the folks in Minnesota uh, who have been standing on the front lines and send a signal today that says we're gonna act. We hope the EAC acts, uh, uh, but we are prepared to act uh, uh, to ensure that folks uh, um, have the fundamental security to know uh, that this preemption exists. My question, uh, uh, Representative Wagamot, is uh, I know that there were some uh, uh, frontline folks who are not in this, and I think uh, Mr. Reynoso referred to it, but I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of um, what it means for workers to operate without this presumption for these firefighters and, um, and uh, police officers and nurses, um, what they're facing in terms of, um, if we have any comparables, it'd be helpful to hear uh, uh, what that means to operate without it. Representative Wolgamont. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, there's a really good report that the Department of Labor and Industry has put out that I'd be more than happy to share with you that really highlights some of the differences between uh, workers' compensation claims from the workers who are part of this presumption group and part who are not. Um, I'm looking at a chart right now that has vastly dramatic differences, uh, ranging anywhere from you know 50 to 60 percent as far as the drop in probability that workers outside of the presumption group will have their uh, workers' compensation claims denied. So, um, you know, for example, I think it was Mr. Reynoso who talked about the meatpacking workers who, uh, of the thousands of meatpacking workers who have submitted claims, only 10 of them uh, were able to get their, um, uh, were able to get their benefits. So, absolutely. And, and, and as some of our other testifiers have said, you know, we want our frontline workers focused on keeping us safe, caring for us when we're sick and looking after our children, not on having to prove that they got this virus while they're on the job. That is the spirit of this presumption and why it's so important that we get this passed as quickly as possible. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just again, thank you for bringing this. I think we all should be acting with the, the urgency that these workers are acting uh, with to, to care and support um, our communities. And so appreciate you bringing it. Uh, looking forward to voting for it. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, Representative uh, Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I think I got to think back a couple of years when uh, when Representative Sundin was chairing the Labor Committee. I came before the committee with a bill regarding uh, safety for our window washers, and uh, I thought it was a great, great, great bill. And and uh, it didn't pass the committee. And Representative Sundin gave me some advice. He said, uh, why don't you check in with the Construction Codes Advisory Council? So this last year, I've attended two of their meetings, Zoom, and uh, they're working on some language for me. So <laughs> I, uh, I think uh, Representative Wogamong, he, he probably should have really checked into the council and, and brought it to their attention and maybe attended some of their meetings and got that support. And I, I also had good conversations with uh, the Commissioner Robertson on my on my my legislation. So I think that's something that, that uh, as we've been in the legislature longer, we learn those types of things and we work together in those things. So that'd be my recommendation to uh, Representative Wogama. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Representative, Representative McDonald, I purposely skipped over you because uh, you'd already commented once and we had some people that hadn't commented yet. So uh, your turn for round two, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's uh, what I presume that you did. So I appreciate that. Well, I, I think I can speak for many in the room or the Zoom, I should say, that uh, Representative Wogamot's bill has, uh, it's has the, we, we agree on the meat and potatoes of it. We wanna take care of our frontline workers. But Representative Wogamot did not cook the meat and the potatoes. Now, if you've eaten meat and potatoes that are raw, they don't taste very good. So they have to go back to the kitchen for cooking. And that is what the WCA has done. They have, they have put this work together. They've met since August. 
the members of this group. They've taken the time necessary to look into the issue and come up with some recommendations. Now, Representative Borgamot says he has a great respect for the group. So much respect, he couldn't even wait one day for the recommendation. That kind of indicates a lack of respect, but I don't want to judge your character, Re Representative Wogamont. Maybe you can do that on your own, pull the bill, and show the respect that you claim you have for this group that is doing the work. So um, I, I, again, I would say that uh, my advice is that we uh, table the bill, pull it, uh, let, the, uh, let the Workman's Comp Advisory Council do the work that they're going to do tomorrow after spending months and hours on it as a group, bipartisan group. And at the end of the day, Commissioner Roberts said, don't do it. If we don't listen to our commissioners, not that they're right all the time, Mr. Chair, and it's good to have a healthy debate and perhaps a disagreement from time to time, but with her recommendation and the fact you heard other testimony, this bill is certainly not necessary at this time. We need to listen to the commissioner and uh, pull the bill and wait for the advisory council who will be back to uh, with us within a day. In the meantime, those who have made a claim, they will be taken care of. We've heard no testimony otherwise. So it's up to you at the end, Mr. Chair. I trust your wisdom that you'll do the right thing and not call the vote, table this bill until we hear from the Workman's Comp Advisory Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Any other uh, member questions or comments on the bill? Well, members, 1.5 years ago, these frontline workers that we are talking about were hailed by many of us and many of us as heroes. And they are our heroes. They have taken care of our communities, our state in this pandemic. This committee will always put workers and working families first. As long as I am chair of this committee, that's gonna be our number one priority, workers and working families. That's what we're gonna work for. That's what we're gonna strive for. It's time that we as a state take care of these workers for their heroic work taking care of us. With that, Representative Wogamont, any last comments? Well, first, Mr. Chair, I would really like to thank you for your leadership in being willing to hold uh, this hearing outside of the regular schedule so that we can stand up and have this conversation for these workers. I want to thank each and every one of the members of your committee for taking time to be a part of this and have this discussion. Uh, it really, it shows that this chair and this committee are committed to workers and having the discussion to stand up for them. So I want to thank each and every one of you for that. I would just, again, Mr. Chair, like to emphasize a couple of things uh, with regards to my engagement with the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. Again, at the last meeting of the WCAC, they adjourned with no agreement, with no compromise. And their plan going forward, the, the thing that I heard was that their next meeting was going to be on February 9th. Um, during that time in between their meetings, if we look at the numbers from December, that would have been an estimated 903 workers who would have contracted COVID-19 and been left to dry while they were in between meetings. I wish that they had been able to reach a deal on this long ago. Um, I'm committed to working with them. I've reach out and, and try to be in conversation with uh, both the House liaisons to that committee. Um, I, I continue to want to work with them. I hope, I'm glad that they had this special meeting after you know, we announced our plans to, to continue pushing on this. I hope that there is an agreement reached that is in the best benefit of these workers. But I wanna make sure that we as a legislature aren't leaving these workers left behind. I want to make sure that there's no stone left unturned to make sure that these brave men and women who are putting their physical health on the line, who are putting their financial health on the line, have the coverage that they need to do their jobs and be safe. That's why I'm grateful for your time today, Mr. Chair and members. And that's why I ask for your support to keep this bill moving forward so that whether it's this bill or an agreement that is made by the WCAC, we're able to get this through our process to the governor's desk and sign and get these workers covered as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much. Members. Thank you, Representative Wolgamont. I will renew my motion that House File 2656, as amended, be referred to the General Register. Mr. Petrie, please take the call. Representative Eklund. Yes. Representative Eklund, yes. Representative Zhang. Yes. Representative Zhang, yes. Representative Detmer. Oh. 
Representative Detmer, no. Representative McDonald. McDonald, no. Representative McDonald, no. Representative Berg. Yes. Representative Berg, yes. Representative Bliss. No. Representative Bliss, no. Representative Edelson. Yes. Representative Edelson, yes. Representative Frederick. Yes, yes. Representative Frederick, yes. Representative Greenman. Yes. Representative Greenman, yes. Representative Nelson. Nelson, yes. Representative Nelson, yes. Representative Poston. Poston, no. Representative Poston, no. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, no. Representative Raleigh, no. Representative Sundin. Yes. Representative Sundin, yes. Mr. Chair, there's eight ayes and five nays. Thank you, Mr. Petri with eight, uh, Petri with eight, five, eight yeas and five nays. The motion is passed. The bill is on its way to the general register.